Okay. Let's get out of this. All right. Hey everyone, and welcome back to CS196. And welcome to Python 1. So, as we mentioned at the start of the class, we want to teach you concepts using Python and Rust. Well, we can't teach you those concepts unless you have a rough understanding of how the language is actually going to work. So we're going to do the basics of Python today, and on th Thursday, Sammy's going to cover a few higher level concepts too. So with that being said, let's go over objectives. So firstly, we're going to go over what is Python and what is Pythonic code. Then we're going to go over a super quick setup info. I'm not really going to touch on it too much, but just in case you want to run the code alongside. Uh, then we're going to cover quick hello world, variables, conditionals, then loops, functions, lists, and finally exception handling. So a lot of this you might have seen already in 125, or if you've programmed another language, you might have seen this already. But we're going to cover in Python, and exception handling might be something new to you, even if you have taken 125. So what is Python? Well, pretty basically, it's a programming language in the end. OK, no, we're going to go a little more in depth than that, so you guys will have talking points for interviews and stuff. So Python is an interpreted, object-oriented, high-level programming language with dynamic semantics. <sighs> OK, that's a real mouthful. This is taken exactly from the Python documentation. So let's actually go through this line by line and try to explain what that means. So let's go through interpreted. So interpreted languages are run by an interpreter, which reads the code line by line. So unlike programs like C, C++, or Java, which compiles the whole code and then runs it, Python will take an interpreter and read it line by line and run it line by line instead of making one executable and running the whole thing. But actually, it's a little more complicated than that. Python isn't just interpreted. It actually has one compilation step into bytecode first. And bytecode is just a low-level set of instructions that can be read by the interpreter. And it's a very quick compilation. And it basically lets the interpreter read things a little quicker. And those files end in .pyc or .pyo. And don't worry, that made no sense at all. You don't really need to know it. It's just a cool fact that I think it's good to bring up in interviews to show that you understand the language beyond just knowing how to use it. And Python files have a .py extension. So what is Python again? It's an object-oriented language as well. So object-oriented, you probably heard this a lot. Essentially, it's a programming paradigm centered around the idea of using objects. Seems pretty self-explanatory. But objects essentially abstract away complex problems. So instead of writing a list every single time, you can use a list object to make your life simpler. Essentially, they abstract away the problem so you have a higher level understanding of the code. And instead of using traditional lines of code and data, we can just use objects instead. Finally, we have a high level programming language. So essentially, a high level programming language has strong abstraction of the lower level aspect of the computer. So essentially what that means is instead of making you write in zeros and ones, or like in C, making you allocate memory and do really nitty gritty things like that, it'll handle a lot of it for you at the cost of hiding more things from you. So you lose a little bit of control, but you have a much smoother experience and it's great, especially for new programmers. So what is Pythonic code? So I'm gonna touch on this very, very quickly. Sam will go over it more later. Uh, but Pythonic code is simply a design choice to produce highly readable Python code. So Python veterans uh, will usually write in Pythonic style instead of writing code that's very C style or Java style in Python. So note, poorly styled code can still do all the things that beautiful Pythonic code can, but code maintenance is essential for real developers, and you guys are all going to be real developers eventually. So you should focus on writing more readable code, and Pythonic code is really the epitome of that. Dynamic semantics is a great point. It's just a very, essentially it's a nitty gritty of how uh, typing works and how uh, it's read by interpreter. We, that's not too important. So finally, a good rule of thumb, which I think you guys should remember is if you can write less while maintaining readability in Python, do that. Again, I'm not saying try to compress your entire program function into one line if it's super messy and doesn't make any sense, but if you can make it shorter and easier to read, definitely do that. And G-Floor Pythonic is actually 
an official term that people use. And here's some good examples. I'm not going to get into it too much because Sam will cover it later. Super quick setup info. So here's the links to the documentation to help you set up on different OSs. And if here's another article that I found is pretty useful. We're also, you can also use an online editor like Replit. So for a lot of the code you see today, if you have the lecture slides opened up, you can just click on a link, which I'll keep next to it, and you can actually run the code that we're using today. And that'll be really useful. So let's do it, our very first Python program. So let's say you read those articles I had in the previous slide, recommended IDEs for Python. I'd say VS Code, I use VS Code uh, for everything. So our very first Python program. So let's say you set up everything in the previous slide. How do we check that everything is working? Well, as with most languages, we're gonna create a hello world program. And this is a super easy way to check in the environment stuff correctly and if we have all our packages installed. It seems like it might be very like irrelevant, but even for people who've been programming for years and years, I still do this. When I'm starting a new language and I set it up, I'm gonna print hello world so I know that everything is in place. So after we create our .py file with the code, we can run the script in bash by writing Python and then the file name .py or Python 3. So that really depends on how you set up Python. I'm not going to get go into that too much. But let's go to how we print stuff in Python. So if we want to print stuff in Python, we just write print, put a bracket, and then we put whatever we want to print in there within speech marks. So you've probably seen this a lot in other languages. Okay. Just going to put VS Code here. So we have print hello world. We have that file here. Let's open up our iTerm. Oop, don't look at that. So if I run this, it does this hello world. Okay, cool. So we know they're officially set up, and this is the first thing you guys should do when you're setting up Python on your machines. For the rest of the lecture, I'm not going to use VS Code. I'm going to use Replit. That way, uh, you guys can follow along too. Okay, do we have any questions about anything? I think that's pretty straightforward. Yep, okay, no questions. So let's get into for the first thing, variables. So quick recap of variables. Variables help us store stuff in our programs. The reason I say stuff and not data is because we can store more than just data within variables. So you can think of it as a box that you keep things in. Numbers, strings, references to other variables, data structures, objects, anything can be stored inside a variable. You can even have nothing inside a variable, which I'll cover soon. So variables in Python are cool because you don't need to specify a type. And this is known as dynamic typing. Different data types include integers, floats, strings, booleans. But when you declare these variables, you don't have to specify the specific type. You can just say x equals and put whatever you want. Python will figure it out for you. This can be a gift and a curse, as you will see shortly. Another important type I want to cover is the none type. So from W3Schools, the exact definition I got was none is not the same as zero, false, or an empty string. None is a data type of its own, called the none type, and only none can be none. So you can't, important thing to understand is that none isn't a useless thing. It's actually really useful. Books can be used as an empty placeholder because you can't manipulate the none type. So if you want to declare a variable, but keep it empty, have nothing in there, the none type is a perfect option because let's say you accidentally forget that there's nothing in there and you try to do something like, you know, you add three to the variable, your code will crash because you can't do that with the none type. Exactly. None in Python is like the null in Java. All right, so we have this code here. I'm not gonna have replica for this, it's pretty basic. But if we look at this and we say x is four and we change the type, x is a list now, and we say x is a string now, and we print x, what do you guys think is gonna happen? What will be printed? Just drop a message in the chat. I'm a, yeah, I'm a chameleon, yeah, exactly, the string. So as we said before, dynamic typing means we don't have to declare a type and also variables aren't restricted to a single type. It'll automatically uh, allocate space for whatever you need. So now we have conditionals. So the famous if else. So this is an incredibly powerful way to let you make decisions in your code. So let's look at some operators that we have. So we have the few basic ones. We have like equals equals, and that's true if the values are the same. Not equals, it's true if values are not the same. Uh, greater than or equal to less than or equal to greater than less than those are pretty self-explanatory. I think we have two new ones though, which is pretty unique to Python. We have is and in 
So is text if you're referencing the same object? So you could say something like, if we say x equals three and then go, if x is three, it'll return true. We can also do this if we say x equals a, for example. Let's say we have two variables, x and a. If we say x equals a and do x is a, that will return true because we're referencing the same object. So this is better if you're trying to reference whole objects, not specific values. Then we have in. In is pretty self-explanatory. It checks if a value or an object can be found within another object. So any questions about those? OK, cool. All right, so let's look at this code here. You can run it by clicking on the link here. It'll open up a replit, which you can use. What do you guys think is going to happen with this code? Take a look at it. Drop a message in the chat. And then I'll run it. So I run it. So let's try the else case. Let's say 5. We put 5, it says we have just 5 instead. OK, yeah, input. Let me explain that line very quickly. So someone asked, what is input? Well, input, as you can see, when I run the code, it'll prompt me for whatever the message says. And then whatever I type in here will be stored into x. So if I put 2, x will now be 2. If I hit Enter, it'll say we have 2 instead. So someone said, if we enter 196, it'll print the favorite thing. So let's, let's see if that happens. 196. Wait, it didn't say we have my favorite number. It just says we have 196 instead. That's weird. Well, some of the more eagle-eyed people here have noticed that it says conditional bait up here. Why did that happen? Let's go into full screen. Well, dynamic typing can be a gift and also a curse, unfortunately. What happened is when we took the input, it takes input as a string. It can be because we could have put A, B, C, D in here or any other string. So even though we put only numbers or integers in, those are actually a string character. So what we actually have to do is that we have to cast the input string to an int. So casting essentially means taking whatever we took, the initial data type, and changing this data type to something that we can use. So casting is a pretty common suggestion that you use in many languages. So let's run this code now. Yeah, sorry if you guys got baited. Uh, it's a super common mistake. The reason I put it in there is because I, when I wrote the code the first time, actually had that bug. And I think it's a good, good example of that. So now if we put 196, we have my favorite number. So while the rest of them just says, can we do int input? Yep, you totally can do that. The reason I put it separately was just to explicitly show the dangers of dynamic uh, typing and why we have to be careful about it. So yeah, that's a great point. And this is great, this works. So we're really happy because we were able to use conditionals and we we're able to handle dynamic typing. So what if we have more than two conditions? So I'm sure in Java or C, you just do if else, and then within the else condition, you do if else, some other condition, and you do if else, some other other condition. No, this isn't very Pythonic. It's kind of messy and it's really open, easy for you to have like logical errors using this method. Well, it's more commonly used, and in Python, what I'd say you have to use, especially for this class, is the elif statement. Elif is just short for else if. So you do if some statement. If that statement is false, we'll do else if some other statement, else if some other statement, and you can keep having those. And it's very, very clear what the intended purpose of this string or this set of logical operators wants us to do. And finally, we have the else. So if all these other statements are false, we use the else statement instead. So there's no if nested if statements. So Fepler asks, are there no nested if statements? That's a really good question. We can use nested if statements. Again, bad code or badly styled code will still do what we want, but we'd rather use this because it's much clearer than a nested if statement. It'll still work. Yep, duty says exactly, nested if statements, not epic. Does equals equals not work for strings? I believe this should work for strings, but I can double check that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. Okay, so let's look at this big chunk of code we got here. So it's very similar to before, but let's say if it's 196, we say it's my favorite number, elif, 
So if this is not true, we run, we check if this is true, if it's a multiple of five. So this operator here, percentage sign is just modulus. What modulus means is if we divide X by five, what is the remainder? Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. And finally, that is also not true. We just print, we just have blank instead. So as a sanity check, let's see if we put 186, what happens? We have my favorite number, but if we put 195, it says 195 is multiple of five because we failed this, this case here or this um, logical statement here, but this one was true. So else if we go into there, So any questions for that? What if you put a string that asks you for a number? Well, if you try to cast a string, it'll just crash. So let me put Rohan here. It'll crash because we can't cast uh, a string into base 10. Some other languages will actually let you cast that because each character is technically an ASCII number, which can then be casted into a integer. But C, uh, Python, sorry, will not let you do that. C will let you do that. Yeah, so that's a good question. Someone asked, do you not need parentheses after if and elif? No, you don't need parentheses. So that's also something that's pretty Pythonic. You can put parentheses here if you want for clarity, but you don't need to. Python's pretty smart and understand. You put a colon here and understand that that's the end of the logical operator. So normally in Pythonic code, you don't put the parentheses because it's just extra noise that's not necessary. Someone asked, if we have 195, that's fair enough, would it print both? Another great question. Unfortunately, no, it won't print both because if it hits the first statement, it'll just do that because this is else if. So else means if this is false and this is true. It re requires on both those conditions, not just one. So yeah, good questions, guys. Conditionals continued. And let's say you wanna have multiple conditions, the same conditional statement. You can use the and or the or keyword. So you can do like if X and this is true or if you use or instead. So to, for someone who said you want the same thing on one line, we can do this instead. We could do if x equals equals 196, or an or is a keyword, it'll get highlighted, or mod 5 equals equals 0, we print my favorite number. So let's run this. 195, hit enter, we have my favorite number. Okay. Moving on. Any questions before we get into the Kahoot? How do you print a new line in Python? So the new line character in Python is backslash n. Uh, it's pretty common. So if you want to just print just a new line, you do print backslash n like this. But something to note is if you print in Python, it automatically adds a new line character at the end there. So notice how uh, if I print two things here, hi, and then print 196. They won't continue on the same line. They'll both start a new line because the way the print statement works in Python is that it adds a new line character to the end of whatever string you're trying to print. Linker kind of asks, why did 196 not work at first? It didn't enter first because we inputted a string. So when we inputted a string, a string is not equivalent to the 196 number. 196 in brackets, or sorry, in speech marks like this, is different to 196 uh, as a value like this. How does Python know when loops end? So Python knows when your loop ends because of the white space here. You need to have white space in Python. That's actually a good point there. Normally when you're using your favorite IDE, if you just hit enter from an if statement, it'll automatically tab you four spaces. So you need to have that white space in Python. Actually, let me zoom out a bit so it's clearer. Um, whereas in Java, you might have like uh, parentheses like this. Python doesn't use that. Python instead uses white space to indicate that you're within another layer of like an if statement or like a for loop. Great question. What other questions do we have? Matt Zombie, it's a good question. So he's asked in your conditional with X or Y, if this is true, will it evaluate Y? Nope. If this is true, 
it's going to go right to the condition. It won't even check this. So you can put like garbage here, like doing weird stuff with none or something that will break your code and it won't get hit as long as this is true. Um, other questions, let me quick scan. Okay, cool. I think we're all good there. Let's go into the Kahoot. If you haven't joined already, here's the code. I'm going to start the Kahoot in about one minute. I'm going to paste the code here too. And if you have any questions, I will answer them later too. All right, I think we have everyone. I'm gonna give it 30 more seconds that we're gonna join. So, oh, also I'm gonna note that if you're top five in the Kahoot, you'll get extra credit just for fun. Cause this is a lot of important stuff. And if you've been listening, then I think you should be rewarded for that. Most of your projects will be in Python or TypeScript anyway. Okay, I'll help you out. Oh, hey, is five. What's your net ID? Okay. It says you're not in here, so. All right, I am going to start in. One second, we're starting. True or false, is Python a comp compiled only language? That's pretty quick guys, good job. This is the first question, yep. Is Python a compiled only language? Can we have the Kahoot music? Let me know if you can hear it. Can you hear that? Sad. Yeah, I don't think I have my audio recording on. Forty seconds. If nobody answers the next ten, I'm gonna skip. Somebody answered. I think that's everybody. Skip. Yep, all right, most you got it right. False. So Python isn't a compiled only language. Python is officially it's an interpreted language. If you want to get really nitty gritty, there's one compilation step where it goes from your Python code to bytecode, and then that's interpreted. But most people just say Python is an interpreted language. Good job, guys. Most you got it right. There's the scoreboard. True or false, write Pythonic code, less code is usually better. Good 
the job. Most guys got that super quickly. I'm gonna give like another 20 seconds for people with like latency issues, just for in the interest of time. We'll just be on the midterm. This class has no midterms, so don't worry about that. Five more seconds and I'm gonna skip. All right, again, most of you guys got this right. Yep, Pythonic code, a good rule of thumb is less code is usually better as long as you're maintaining readability. No quizzes, no final. So you're totally fine. Leaderboard again. Next question. What would this chunk of code do? Some people just guess the answer too, so don't worry if you're not getting super quick. There's four choices because there's four options. This one's a little tricky, so uh, think about it. Gonna give it 20 more seconds, 15 more seconds actually. Okay, so a little mixed here. That's totally fine. This was kind of tricky. So this is actually going to fail on line two because if you have the none type and you try to manipulate it, it'll crash. You can't do anything none type. You can't, you could print it out, but you can't do stuff like adding to it, dividing it, et cetera, et cetera. None is none, it's null. You try to mess with null, your code's going to crash. So good job, leaderboard. Good job, first place, maintain your spot. What would be printed at the end of this code snippet? Here's another photo. Again, this isn't super obvious, so read it carefully. You're on question four because this is question four, turns out. All right, so Emily Carr asked, how is the none type of placeholder if you can't manipulate it? Well, it's a placeholder because let's say you just want to define a variable X, but you don't have anything in it at the moment. You put none in it because that way if you forget about it and you try to manipulate X, it'll crash and you know it's a reminder to you that you put none in it and that you wanted to put something real inside it later. So it's just a placeholder because it can let you define a variable because you can't just declare a variable with nothing in it in Python. So you can just define an empty variable essentially. Or if you want to clear a variable, you can put that instead. Uh, quick plot, I don't know how you're on question five, I'm sorry. All right, four seconds. We have latency issues, so I understand why it's taking a little longer. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, oh, great. I thought you guys would trip up more here, but you guys are clearly smarter than I thought. So great job. Uh, so the reason it's case two is because if you go to the first line here, this is false because x mod three is not zero. This is not divisible by three, so you won't go here. But here, x mod seven, 200 mod seven will give you a number that's not zero because 200 isn't divisible by seven. And because it's not zero, it's evaluated as true. Anything not zero is true in most programming languages, to be honest. So this will be true. You'll print case two and you'll never reach these lower lines here. Yeah. A little tricky, what you remember is this won't give you true or false. This will return a value and the value returned wasn't zero. And because it wasn't zero, it's evaluated as true. Yep, sorry if that was a little tricky, uh, but you guys did a good job. Most of you guys got that right, so excellent work. So back to the lecture for the next half of content. And this is where stuff gets a little harder with Python at least. So loops, 
So if you don't know what a loop is, a loop allows us to repeatedly run the same section of code. Oh wait, only 10 people got it right? Oh, rough, I thought most of you got it right. That's my bad, <laughs> my bad. Yeah, good job to the 10 people who got it right. The rest of you, I am sorry. Uh, so we're gonna cover for loops and while loops in Python. Those are the main loops. I think it's the only loops actually. So here is the general pseudocode for how we do for loops in Python. So I want to emphasize something. It's very different to what you normally see in Java. So in Java, you write, you declare a variable like int i while i is less than something. You do i plus plus. So here, this range function handles all that for you. So you say for i or some variable in a range, you do stuff. So it's easy to explain code. So if we do for i in range 10, essentially what this is saying is we're declaring a variable i for int i equals zero, while i is less than 10, it defaults to i plus plus. So we default at zero if we don't specify the first number and we go up to 10, but not including 10. So think of it as int i equals zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus as the case in your for loop. And we'll just print i. And again, we can follow all these code samples here. And thankfully they're all on one big one here. So we can just comment the rest of these out. And if we run this, it's just gonna go from zero to nine, as expected. So next, another way we can do this, any questions? Oh, the shortcut for commenting is command or control forward slash. That's super useful. Uh, highly recommend using that instead of just typing a hash key. So here we specify the start value and the end value. The start value is inclusive and the end value is exclusive. What I mean by that is if we put two here, we'll print two and we'll go up to 10, but we won't print 10, we'll print nine instead. So, let's run this. It's gonna go two to nine instead. This is the code sample that we just saw previously. And as you can see, two to nine, as expected. Makes sense, right? All right, cool. Here, I'm just gonna do something real quick. Okay. So now something really important is, and very Pythonic is, we don't need to specify uh, the step inside the loop here. We don't have to do I plus equals two or something weird like that. What we can do is if we have a third optional parameter, we can specify the step. So what this is gonna do is starting from two, it's gonna keep adding two to I up until we reach 10, excluding 10. So what this does is it'll go from two to nine, adding two, but nine won't be included because when we hit eight and we add two to 10, we'll be out of the range. So that's a little complicated. If we hit eight and we add two, we're at 10, which is outside the range that we specified here. So we break out of the loop. So someone said, why does it print? So for I in range two to 10, why does it print from two to 10 instead of three? That's just the way Python works. It's inclusive of the start, exclusive of the top end. And I'm sorry, that's confusing, but that's just how the language works. Okay. A cool thing with this as well is that if you use a negative number, uh, we can iterate backwards through a list if this first number is uh, bigger than the second number here. If we do it backwards, but this is if we put minus one here, but this is smaller and this is bigger, we'll go into a forever loop because we'll never reach that top number. So if we see that in the code, this is what we just saw down here. When I run it, we go two, four, six, eight, but we won't reach nine or 10 because that's already outside the range. Do you have ins integers inside the range? Nope, you don't need to have integers inside the range. Okay. So another way you can do this is you can do in. So someone asked, can you give an example of in? Well, we have it right here. So this is pseudocode again. So we can say for a variable name in a data structure, we do stuff. So this is a list in Python. We will cover that very, very shortly. So don't worry if that is new. Essentially, it's very similar to an array, but it's definitely not an array not an array, list is not an array. 
uh, so for value in x, print the value. So no words for explaining what this does. Is that essentially what it'll do is it'll just print every single value in x196, like that. This is a very Pythonic way of doing it because uh, it's two lines of code and it's very, very clear what's happening here. But if you want to see a C style version of this or a Java style version, you could do it like this for i in range length of x print each uh, individual element within there. And that'll do the exact same thing here. Oh, I should comment this out, my bad. It'll do the exact same thing, print 186. All right, so that's pretty basic. So now we have a while loop. So a while loop is very, very similar to Java or C. This is pseudocode. So while some statement is true, we run the code. And ignore the is be highlighted there. That's just um, uh, the ID being weird. So for example, sorry about that. Let's say X is 100. While X is greater than 50, print X, and then we decrement X by one. So minus equals one. What's cool about this is it's a uh, it's operated used for any normal operator. So you could do plus equals, multiplied equals, divided by equals. So this is essentially decrementing x by one each time and then printing it. Usually is is used more. So I'm going to ask, is it is used more than equals equals? It really, really depends. I'd say to be safe, use equals equals for the most part because that's evaluating values. But if you have to evaluate objects, use is. So here we have an example code of that if statement here, the while loop. So if I run it, we go from 100 all the way down to 51, but then once it equals 50, so it's no longer greater than 50, we don't, we break out of the while loop. But you gotta be careful because if you don't change the condition or if the condition is always true or uh, you aren't incrementing or decrementing the value of x, so example, while true, it'll just run forever and you're gonna crash your IDE or whatever you're using. Not your ID, sorry, you're going to crash your um, bash or replit or whatever. Oh, my bad. X equals 50. This is never going to end because this condition will never change. While true is always going to be true. Any questions about those loops? How much car not so fast? It's just when a command or control forward slash. So I'm going to close this. So we have break statements. So notice how we were stuck in that loop forever. We couldn't do anything once we're in that loop. But what we can do is use a break keyword. So if Python reads this, it'll break you out of the current loop. So what do you guys think this is going to do? Take a guess, Gander, what you think it's going to do. And while you're thinking about it, I'm going to load up the code. Any guesses for what it's going to do? So let's go through it line by line. So for character in CS96. So one thing I want to note is that list strings in Python are like lists. You can treat it like a list. So it's going to go through each character uh, one at a time. So if the character is a space, a space is right there, we print an empty line and we just break. So I'm going to run. We print CS96 and we break. But notice something cool happened. We didn't print each character on a new line. That's because I replaced the new line character here with just uh, empty, like no space. So this will replace it by, with whatever you want. So if I put like um, an underscore here instead, it'll replace the new line character at the end of the print with underscore like that. Pretty cool, right? Awesome. Okay. Break statements is super useful, especially for those cases when you're within like a loop. I do want to note, note though that if you're in a double for loop and you use break, you'll only break out of the inner for loop or whichever loop called break. It won't break you out of all the for loops. So functions. So I'm sure functions aren't new to you, but I'm going to go quickly. A function is a block of code that we plan on reusing. Instead of writing the same code over and over again, we can write a function instead and call the function instead. So to declare a function in Python, we follow this format. So we'd use the keyword def, give it a name, and we put the arguments here. So notice that in Python, you don't have to define a type for your function. So 
you don't need to define return types or the types of your arguments. Dynamic typing will handle all that for you. So here we have an example here, example code here. You can run it. I'm not going to go through it because it's pretty self-explanatory uh, and to save time. But let's say we do def greet name time of day. We put someone's name and then one of these letters, it'll print hello or good morning and then that person's name. And you can try that later. This is a very basic way of very basic function that we see here. So to call a function, we do function name and we put all the arguments like so. So for example, we do greet Rohan E. And what that would do is it would say pass Rohan here, E here, and say print good after uh, good evening, Rohan. Easy. So a function will return to the code they called it once the function is finished running. So if we want to manually leave a function, uh, we use the return keyword. So return will return to the code segment that called the function. And if we write return and then a list of variables after it, it'll return those variables. So let's look at that over here. So notice this here, right? I'm actually going to run this because this is pretty useful. So if we do define a function here, if x is greater than zero, return one. If it's equal to zero, return zero. And if it's not, return, if it's less than zero, return minus one. So notice how we're returning something here. If I run this, we return those values and we can print those values one after the other. So if you, you could put a list of things here, you could put like multiple things and we print it, it'll return a bunch of things. And it isn't like constant or static. And here's a cool example of getting two numbers back. Uh, so you can go through this code in your own time. Watch how we return two things back. So it'll print two things. Try this out in your own time. Is return to Python similar to Java? Yep, very similar. Now we have lists. So lists are a collection which are ordered and changeable and duplicates are allowed. So lists can remind you of arrays, but they are not arrays. The reason they're not like arrays is because arrays, uh, lists are resizable. They essentially make your life a little easier and had a lot of the complexity. There's more information about what a list exactly is in different kinds of collections on WP schools, if you're curious. So in Python, the types of elements within the list don't need to be the same. And we can use lists for multiple values using one variable. So again, all the code is here. So let's open that up. You define a list using just empty square brackets. And you can put values in it like so. So this is all strings, but I could put numbers in here instead of just strings or anything that I want, essentially. And to access an element, we use the square brackets followed by the index that we want. And remember that Python index is zero indexed like that. And this will print the, the zero index, so it'll print C. And this will print the third index, so 0, 1, 2, 3, it'll print 9. But if you do these lines here, your code will crash. So be careful. If you want to get the length of a uh, list, sorry, you write len x or whatever the variable is, and it'll print the len. So this will return 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I did speed through that because that's very similar to what you see in Java. But I want to talk about slicing now. Slicing is a very Pythonic way of getting a range of values within a list. So if you do two colon five or something colon something, you will start at this first value here and go up until this last value. So here, if you go zero, one, two, three, four, five. So five, we don't reach five. We stop just after the look before it, but we'll get 196. So that I want to show you guys. So look at the top thing here, we get 196, like so. And now notice that if we don't specify something after the colon or before the colon, we go to the end or start of the list respectively. So two to five here is the same as going two colon nothing, because that just specifies going all the way to the end. And if you do zero to two, it's equivalent to writing nothing to two because that means we're from the start of the list to the second. Do I go out of bounds? You won't go out of bounds if you specify nothing here because it'll just stop at the end. 
And yes, these are indexes here. So these values are indexes. The colon separates the starting index and the ending index. So like in a lot of other languages, lists in Python are simple arrays of bytes. And there's no, so a string can be treated as a list essentially. There's no single character data type like in other languages. A single character is just a list of length one. So because of this fact, we can treat strings like lists. So for example, if we do s and slice it from the second index to the end, we go 0, 1, 2 to the end, it'll print 196. So I'll say, what if you minus 3? If you minus 3, it'll actually start from the end and go backwards. It'll go 0, 1, 2, 3, and then go forward like that. And here's a bunch of useful list functions. Uh, I'm not going to go through these in depth because you're not going to be asked about these, but these are really useful. What they do want to talk about, though, is sort. So sort here will sort your list using the time sort function. So instead of writing your own bubble sort or something like that, using the sort function that's built in is a really powerful tool because it uses the time sort algorithm that's very, very fast and you can sort your list very quickly. So remember that because it's useful for like interview questions and stuff. So looking at time, I'm not sure if we can quickly go through exception handling, uh, but don't worry if it's too much. This is a little more advanced and Sandy will probably cover it again. So when an exception or error occurs, Python will stop running and send us an error message. It's not a graceful, graceful exit. But if we use exception handling, we can handle the exception without crashing the program. So to do this, we use the try except and then the finally commands. So if an exception occurs in the try block, Python catches the exception and moves on to the except block and runs the code in there. So what would this code do? So if I open this up while it's loading, this code's gonna crash. You can't concatenate a number to a string. It's just gonna crash. But here's what we can do instead. Let's say we do try x plus equals two. If an exception happens within the try block here, let me get the pointer. The try exception happens here. We'll hit the exception case here and then print we hit an exception instead. That's exactly what happens. So I can show that here. Let me comment this out. If I run this, instead of crashing, it's going to handle the exception, catch it, and move us onto the accept statement. It is similar to Java try catch, very, very similar, yeah. So the code in the final lead block we run regardless of whether an exception occurs or not. And this is an optional step. Usually you won't use it. You can just write try accept. But it's useful if you're returning or exiting from the program. Essentially, it'll just uh, print, do whatever's happening finally before returning or exiting. So for here example, if there's an error here, it'll print the error. But before returning, it'll do whatever function we have here. So does that make sense? That uh, went uh, pretty quickly. Okay. I'm gonna talk about this very quickly because I think it's really cool and fun. So when to use try except over if else. So if else always has a cost to that comparison. However, try except on the other hand is very minimal cost if no exception occurs. But if an exception does occur, it's very expensive. So this is known as branching and you'll cover that in 233. Don't worry about it too much. All you need to know is that if else, we're always going to compare if and else. But with try except, we assume that try is almost always going to happen, so we don't really uh, give a lot of time to the except. We just assume it's going to be try, but if an exception happens, it's very expensive to like account for that risk. So therefore, use try except exceptions are rare, like less than 10% of the time. Otherwise, you can use stick to else. So I want to show you that here. And the Stack Overflow article here explains it really well. But you can run this code here. What, what it does is it runs like a 10 million, whatever number that is, iterations using if else, and then the same code with try except. And while this is running in the background, I will answer any questions you guys have. So any questions about the stuff we covered right now? If any money on the program, nope, it's computational time.
So any questions about try, accept, or list? Because we went to that kind of quick. Can you do another try, accept, and explain it? Yeah, for sure. So if we look at this code here, right? Let's do something we can't do. That example with the none. So let's say x equals none. Uh, try x plus equals three, except print uh, none hit like this. So, oh, sorry, I'm trying to zoom out. If uh, x is none and we try to add something to it normally, the code will crash. But if you have something in the try block, Python is like, okay, this could potentially crash. So I'm gonna make sure to catch any exceptions. The exception that happens here, I know that it's gonna happen. So I catch it and I move into here instead. The code will continue to run, none hit. And then I can run more code here and that'll work. Okay. Any other questions about what you guys saw? saw today regarding lists or error handling or anything else regarding Python. What's the finally thing? So finally with try accept, basically what finally does is, this is still loading for some reason, I'm not sure why. What finally does is regardless of whether try happens or accept happens, finally will be run afterwards. So if in one of these cases you return. So let's say there's an exception and you want to return, like leave the function. You can still run some code in the finally block before you return, is what it's saying. Uh, don't worry about the Kahoot. If you, if you answer a question, you'll be fine. Why not put the code outside the finally? So do you a good question. I thought, I also thought it was kind of useless to have this here, but actually, let's say I put the return here and there's no uh, finally, uh, finally tag here. You'll just return and you won't run any more code. What finally lets you do is finish and do some cleanup before you return and leave the function. Lists are filled using square brackets and arrays are zero. Yep. Is there a big difference in big O notation for try and if? Big O notation, no. But if you're looking at actual just speed and like the way the low level stuff works, yes. And I'm trying to run this for you guys, but it's not opening up for some reason. If it doesn't open up, I'll run it on VS Code. We're gonna run it on VS Code. So we have the speed test here. So it's gonna take a couple seconds uh, because it's a very, very big number that we're trying to do. That's the code. And we're gonna do this many iterations. It's a lot of iterations but notice how much quicker. So it took 14 seconds for if else and only seven seconds for try accept. Yeah, Python is relatively slow language because uh, it's written in C and everything is, uh, I don't mean too much, too deep uh, in depth, but essentially everything is malloc, like a lot of memory is handled slowly because you don't control it yourself. It's handled by the interpreter and the compiler. So it's pretty slow in that regard. Any other questions, guys? Also, if you were here, 